Hello, my name is Winford Dorr and I want to talk to all the teachers that are out there that are doing an amazing job and yet still finding that some of the children in their class are not taking it in. So why is it in a class of 30, you teach them with the same methods, you show the same passion and enthusiasm for what you're teaching, and yet five out of the 30 typically will not take it in? What's happening? And why is it that understanding children that are struggling at school isn't taught as a neuroscience subject in teacher training school because there are so many things known today that has not yet reached the whole teacher training process. So if you're a caring teacher, as I'm sure you are, and you want every child to succeed, please stop feeling so guilty about why it is that some don't get it when you teach. So, so why is it that some children struggle? What are the causes of poor reading, poor concentration? Poor sporting skills or social skills. Is the child making a choice? Is the child being lazy? Or is there something else happening? Well, I want to tell you about that something else. Because neuroscience today, and I've been studying it for nearly 20 years now, has got some exciting stuff to share with us. It's taking far too long to, to come from the neuroscience laboratories to the teachers who face, like you, who face these issues every single day as of course do the parents, and I'm a parent. And I had four children, one of my children struggled to learn, had the same wonderful teachers, and yet struggled to learn. Teachers gave extra effort, still struggled to learn. Teachers went home disheartened. Well, I'm gonna to jump to the end because recently I had the thrill of going back to those teachers and say, do you know what, what you were teaching Susie more than 20 years ago? Actually, it was there, she couldn't use it, but it was there, you'd got it in, you had done your job, even though you felt like you hadn't. So I had the thrill of doing that. Now, I own a private school, so I work with teachers and I'm a big fan of them. And I really believe that so many of the issues we see with poor learning today should not be placed at teachers' doors. Where should it be placed? In the brain, which is where the difference is caused. So let's go over some of the common, more common issues that children face when they struggle. Reading is a common one. It seems to affect about one in four, one in five children are slower at reading than they could and should be. What's going on? The root cause is here. The root cause is in the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is the brain within the brain. It's the bit that determines whether or not we become good, whether we become natural at different types of skill. Reading is a skill. And in particular, Eye tracking is a skill. Those children that don't suffer from read, don't do well at reading, nearly always have poor eye tracking. What's that mean? Well, instead of their eyes smoothly tracking the letters and the words that they're trying to read, their eyes are jumping around all over the place. Yeah, you can look on an ocular motor test, look at children that struggle with reading, and virtually everyone you'll see their eyes jumping around. So what happens? Instead of their long-term memory controlling their eye tracking smoothly, that skill has never been fully developed by the cerebellum. And so they have to use their thinking brain to try and control their eyes. Well, when you use your thinking brain to do a skill, you're not a natural at it. Remember when you learned to ride a bike? When you were thinking to ride a bike, you were falling off. Only when you stopped thinking because your brain had created that hardwired program to do it automatically, effortlessly, consistently and naturally, that's when you stopped falling off. Well, it's the same is true of every skill. When we have it developed naturally, we don't think about it. When it's not developed, we have to think about it. And that's exactly what is happening when a child is trying to read. So very often a child that's struggling with reading will use their finger or a ruler to, to try and hold their eye on the line. Why? Because the skill of smooth eye tracking has never developed. So, eyes jumping all over the place, and you can actually see that. Put a finger up in front of a child, get them to hold their head still and follow your finger, and often it's bad enough you can actually see their eyes jumping rather than smoothly tracking your finger. So, if that's the case, what happens? Thinking brain trying to control the eye tracking, eyes jumping around, every time they see a word, the letters go in in a different rambled, ra uh, uh, scrambled order. So the first thing they have to do is unscramble those letters. 
Where? In the thinking brain. The thinking brain that's already full of controlling their eye tracking itself. So thinking brain is doing eye tracking, now it's got to unscramble the letters. When they finally unscrambled it and worked out the word that they're reading, if they have, they then got to store that word. Where? In the thinking brain. Oh, that's pretty busy around there. So guess what? By the time they've struggled through a sentence to get to the end, they have forgotten the words at the beginning of the sentence, so they have to re-read it. Wow, that's tragic. Well, there's lots of things going on there. First of all, the thinking brain's in overload. When the thinking brain's in overload and you've got no capacity left, you don't remember. You also feel very stressed and very frustrated. So that whole overload, that whole process, it's no wonder they, they can't spell, because every time they've seen a word, the letters have been in a different order. So a child that's got poor eye tracking, first of all, it's nothing to do with their intelligence. Sometimes it's the reverse. So you get a really bright child that has no eye tracking, and then when the exams come at the end of the year, we think they've got low intelligence. No, nothing to do with intelligence. It's completely disregarding that. Often bright children have poor eye tracking, poor reading, and take very little in by reading. They're very poor spellers. They get very tired because their thinking brain is having to do the basic process of tracking their eyes. So this is really hard work for them. And you might say, why haven't I been told this before? It actually makes sense. It does make sense. The science is there to show it. Don't ask me why the whole education industry hasn't adopted this, because the science has been there for a long time. And the, the proof that it should happen, the proof that it does happen, and also what you can do about it, has been out there for nearly 20 years now. So nearly a generation has been lost needlessly. But the science is still there, the solutions are there, and I want you to understand it is not your fault if a child is not a good reader. It's nearly always something neurological that has caused it. But those children that have poor eye tracking, that's a fine motor skill, the terminology of the brain. Their handwriting is also a fine motor skill. So the same bit of the brain that develops eye tracking also develops the control of the tips of their fingers. So when they come to write, they'll either be a poor reader, a poor writer, or they will hold their pen in a funny way. So they write with their whole hand rather than just with the tips of their fingers. Why? Poor eye tracking, poor fine motor controls, poor fine motor controls in the tips of their fingers. So they will use the whole hand. That's a gross motor skill. So often you'll see that connection between children who read poorly and write poorly. Now, sometimes you get a child that actually writes very slowly and neatly and still has a fine motor skill. Usually they're using a drawing action when they do that. So often children that have poor writing can be, not always, but can be good artists. It's a different skill, gross motor versus fine motor. So have a good look at how a child holds the pen. There's no point in forcing them to hold the pen in the classical way with their fingertips because if they've got no fine motor controls, that's not going to help. So how do you tackle poor reading and poor writing? You either tackle it at the symptom end, which is really hard work, or you tackle it at the root cause end. And where's that? In the cerebellum, in this brain within the brain. And this is a program that we can share with you and, and uh, tell you more about which will help very significantly in virtually every case. So there's some good news out there. What about when they've got a poor fine motor skill and they find writing hard work? What's going to happen to the volume of their writing? This often concerns teachers that the child might only write two or three lines when you're asking them to write a full page composition. What's happening? Well, rather like when you're with eye tracking, when your fine motor control of your fingers is poor, your thinking brain is full of controlling your fingers, doing it manually, thinking about it. When that happens, you've got no mental capacity to pull together all those thoughts you need to write. So a child with those issues won't have much capacity, probably won't be writing very much at all. Solve the root cause. You free up the need to use working memory to control the fingers and you've got a lot of working memory there, suddenly they can fill that working memory with all their thoughts and you'll find far more fluid expression in writing of what they want.
I hope this is making sense. Science behind everything I'm saying is there. And if you want to access it, then you can look it up on our website. Please do. There's a lot of science out there that's worth studying. And when, if you do go back to your teacher training college, please make sure that for every future teacher, they teach this stuff because it's so, so important. You're thinking it's three steps forward and two and a half back sometimes. How demoralizing? Well, it's not your fault. And remember the thrill I had in going to my daughter's headmistress and saying, do you know what? You and your teachers were getting far more in than ever you got the credit for. So let's put that right right now. The same is, problem is true of concentration. Often children who are told that they're lazy because they're not concentration concentrating are, exact, are actually exhausted. So if the process of auditory conversion, in other words, turning what you hear into thoughts you understand, if that is a, not a fully developed skill in the brain, then those children will have to be doing an extra mental process over all the others. Now, the mental processes we do are much, much slower than the hardwired processes. Neuroscientists are arguing about this right now, whether it's 40,000 times quicker to use a hardwired process as opposed to a mental process, or a million times. Well, quite frankly, I couldn't care whether it's 40,000 or a million times faster. It's an awful lot faster. So children that are struggling with concentration because of auditory processing issues are working much, much harder than any other child in the class. So a child that can't concentrate for long, and you can see that if, they, if they're playing a computer game, they'll be so in it, they probably won't even hear you if you try and talk to them. Get them to concentrate in class, and after a while, they're looking out of the window. Out of choice? No, it's not their, their decision. They're exhausted. In 10 or 15 minutes, they'll be doing as much work with mental processing as the others in the class will do in a whole day. So please understand them. Please be sympathetic to them. Now, you imagine if a child is shy, what's happening? Well, it's either poor auditory processing, so what they're hearing takes a long time to go in. And by the time it's gone in, the conversation has gone on without them. Sometimes it's also that what they are thinking that they want to speak takes an extra half a second or even a second to process before they can get it out of their mouth. So any child that has any listening or speaking delay in processing that is often the cause of shyness. Can you do something about it? Yes, you can. Deal with the symptoms or the root cause? Dealing with the root cause gets the issue dealt with far more thoroughly and naturally. It's far easier to achieve too. So please understand shyness. You can't force confidence on someone, but you can deal with the root cause and help that natural confidence develop in a natural and lasting way. So piecing all this together, what do we know? We know that, for instance, if you ask a child that's struggling to read out loud in class, you're just stressing them badly. It doesn't solve anything to force them. It doesn't solve anything by shouting at them or getting irritated or frustrated or putting them down. That's the exact opposite. Please understand children that are struggling with these things. They're not lazy. They're not choosing to be like this. They have a developmental issue. And likewise, Remember that the same can be true of their sporting skills or their social skills. These are all skills that they're really good at or not, according to the development of the brain. So please respect what's going on in their brain in evaluating and feeding back to them about what is happening. Can you do something about it? Yes, you can. And remember, it's not low intelligent intelligence. It's the way the cerebellum has developed. So, so many children, when they leave school, having struggled at school, go on to great success. Others end up struggling and underachieving the whole of their lives. So very often there's no correlation between success at school and what happens in later life. Why? Because we haven't understood the brain and what it is that enables learning to happen. So I'm gonna end on one final bit of good news for you. And as Susie experienced that she was able to read and write quite quickly, 20 years after she left school, and that was because the teachers had done a great job in getting it in. What we did in developing the cerebellum was to complete the development of the bit that hardwires skills. All the hard work had been done by the teachers. We came along, 
made some final connections and all the work the teachers had done 20 years ago was there ready to use. So she started getting excited when she could read and when she could write and I remember getting excited when she started using capital letters and full stops for the first time. We didn't teach her that. Teachers 20 years earlier who thought they'd failed had taught her that. So you're achieving far, far more than you're getting credit for. And if you want to know more about the science, it's really fascinating and it'll help you get an even greater understanding of each of those children that are currently struggling in your class. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for listening now. And I wish you well in understanding children and teaching them in the future. Bye bye.